TIE Fighter is a Star Wars combat space flight simulator where you take on the role of a TIE pilot fighting against the enemies of the Empire and bringing peace and order to the galaxy. You will fly several different fighter ships against classic rebel vessels and maybe even a few ships you have never seen before. So what are you waiting for, cadet? On with the review! If you plan to pick up Star Wars TIE Fighter Special Edition, you would do well to know a few things before going into it. First, you're going to need a joystick. Or you're going to need to check out the modding scene. There's a highly dedicated fan base which has put out a mod that can revamp your whole experience with TIE Fighter and the various other Star Wars Flight Simulator games. And they even let you bind modern controllers to the game. But unfortunately at this time I cannot comment on that because I haven't done that. At some point I hope to come back to it, and maybe I'll have a video on that later on down the line. Furthermore, when you pick up TIE Fighter Special Edition, you're actually getting three different choices of game to play. When I was very little, my dad owned the DOS TIE Fighter game from 1994. You have no idea how much I wish we still had the box, manual, and the floppy disks. For my playthrough, I played and streamed on Twitch the entire TIE Fighter Special Edition. I played the special edition because I really like voice acting and I don't always like reading. I also do like the newer-ish graphics. I say newer-ish because the special edition came out in 1994. That's not really new. But let's be real, I'm just as ready and willing to shoot out the weird polygonal shapes and the yellow triangles in the training course in the DOS version. Furthermore, in my opinion, nothing beats the DOS music in the 1994 version. At some point I hope to go back and replay TIE Fighter on the DOS version. My playthrough took me a startling 40 hours, and through additional story content I didn't even know was added into the special edition. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. By finishing TIE Fighter's story, I completed a childhood dream in 2021 that little Atratsu never got to experience. I never beat TIE Fighter as a kid. I didn't understand the goals and the objectives. I didn't know how to even navigate the big ship we were in, aka the concourse. I just, I didn't understand that there was a story and I really wasn't at an age where I was reading stuff. So yeah, I kind of made do with just the training courses and a couple missions and I always wondered why I was being shot at by all these different things. The reality is, more often than not, as a kid, I was attacking friendly targets. <laughs> Before we can start talking about TIE Fighter's story, we first need to address the elephant in the room. The TIE Fighter story is obviously no longer canonical. If you look up the characters in the game, some are thankfully out of the Star Wars Legends and back into the canon. Looking at you, Thrawn. Others like Admiral Zarin are still tagged as Star Wars Legends. I'm sure a few people would be amused at how much I could say about the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Rest in peace. Let me remind people that I own a modest collection of Star Wars books, and as a child I manually copied over data from the X-Wing Alliance Technology Library into a notebook. I also purchased the new essential guide to vehicles and vessels, publishing date 2003. I purchased that book because I thought that I could study it to gain a strategic advantage to use in these types of Star Wars Flight Simulator games. Again, this was Child Atratsu, video games were still magic, and anything could happen. I could discover a secret level in a game, if maybe I just rolled my fish on the keyboard at the right angle and I could just... You know. I remember participating in the official Star Wars website forums and sneaking off to the library to post questions about what lightsaber crystal colors meant. There's always a bigger fan out there and I wouldn't dare make a claim like that, but it's safe to say I was rather dedicated. But I'm just going to leave the topic here as it stands and move on. The point I'm trying to make is I was quite immersed and invested in the Star Wars Expanded Universe at the time. The story for TIE Fighter follows the aftermath of Hoth, Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back, if those of you who only watch the films. 
then leads all the way to the Battle of Endor. However, your character never engages in the Battle of Endor. You help prepare for the Battle of Endor, but you're not actually at that battle. You're hanging out with Thrawn at that time. Lucky you, huh? Ace Azamine would have kicked your butt. That, or Ace Azamine would have had his butt kicked? I don't know, don't think about it. Actually, that's not completely accurate. You didn't get anywhere near Endor talks until an expansion and the special edition CD-ROM came out in 1995, which included the rest of the story. The base TIE Fighter game had seven tours of duty. Think of these as chapters, each chapter having about four to five missions. There was eventually an expansion called Defenders of the Empire, which added three more tours of duty, and then there were yet three more tours of duty that were included in the Collector's Edition CD-ROM. All this added together to make Star Wars TIE Fighter Special Edition 13 tours long. Now you see why this took me 40 plus hours to complete. I don't want to extrapolate too much on the finer details of the TIE Fighter story, but in short, there are some twists and turns. As a member of the Empire, you are dealing with the aftermath of losing to a group of rebels who just don't seem to be able to be quite crushed. Much like the Hydra, each time you squash those rebel scum, they regrow a head that needs chopping. But moreover, you still need to help maintain order in the galaxy, and are drawn into several different planetary conflicts. Especially towards the middle of the game, I kind of felt for the Imperials there for a little while. To add to the intrigue, there's fishy stuff going up in the Empire, as a cloaked man will regularly give you special assignments to accomplish for the glory of the Emperor. But who knows what's really going on? Maybe by inspecting every single ship in the dang old game, you'll find out what secrets are hidden away. Ooh. No, but seriously, they're mostly just inspect all the things, capture all the things, that's, that's, the, that's the secret missions. When I think to myself, what basic advice would I give someone with no experience with this genre of game if they wanted to check it out? My mind honestly freezes. How would someone start playing a Star Wars flight simulator game? I've been playing these types of games since I was very little and the mechanics are just so familiar to me. At this time, I've played both X-Wing Alliance and TIE Fighter, and I'll draw from my experience with both games. So far, it seems like the first few missions in both games are very simple missions meant to teach new pilots the reins. However, I'm particularly impressed with TIE Fighter because it actually has a lot of literal training missions. A flight simulator in a flight simulator. It's flight simulator inception. You have a flying obstacle course and high scores that go along for each flyable ship to help you get familiar with the basics of flying and shooting. You also have four training missions for each of the flyable ships in the Imperial Navy. I would highly encourage starting here with the combat training for each ship. Save the missile boat missions because that should be done when you start flying missile bolts for Thrawn much later in the story. By that time, you're going to forget the stuff that you learned. There's some special mechanics to the missile boat. These training missions will teach you the basics of targeting, managing saved targets, targeting enemies attacking your target, shopping at target, mobile systems, flight commands, wingman commands, command and conquer. You get the idea. To rephrase it, this is your starting point especially if you've never played this type of game before. Now then, while I do praise TIE Fighter's optional training tutorial missions, I think that it has an incredibly rough start. If you were unaware, TIE Fighters, TIE Interceptors, and TIE Bombers have no shields. None. Nada. Zilch. Noodle. This makes early missions rough, and I went into this thinking that I was going to be an ace. As I mean, pun intended, in the Imperial Navy in no time. Not so! I was shot down plenty of times. The world is a pretty unforgiving place when it takes blat, 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 and you're dead in three shots. Coupled with my chronic conditions to crash into enemy ships, wingmen, and stationary objects I was trying to fly impressively around. Actually, it's kind of embarrassing. 
Live streaming these games on Twitch would have been much more embarrassing if more people had watched. But thanks to the loyal three viewers who kept checking in on me to make sure I hadn't gone insane. But I digress. TIE Fighter is hardest when you start out with no shields, but you soon get better craft which give you shielding and forgiveness for getting shot a couple times. But simply put, the best way to get familiar with TIE Fighter is to pick up a joystick and give it a try. The more buttons on your joystick the better, but either way you're gonna make keyboard commands while steering your ship and shooting with the joystick. If you can get more buttons, you can rebind them to toggle between warheads or squad commands, thereby making your play slightly easier. The only button I rebound was because some dummy thought button 3 should be toggle off HUD, a completely useless button until I changed it to target nearest enemy fighter. You can also go pretty ham on the shortcuts if you have a lot of buttons on your joystick, but I stuck with the keyboard commands with my one hand and the joystick, th and the joystick throttle with my other. In TIE Fighter, you fly as seven different ships, the classic TIE Fighter, the Interceptor, the TIE Bomber, TIE Advance, Assault Gunboat, the Magnificently Armed TIE Defender, and lastly, the slightly underwhelming Missile Boat. You will spend a fair amount of time in each ship over your Imperial career. Of course, your chances will fare better once you get shields, but don't think about that. I'm sure you're more gifted than me, and will definitely survive all of your sorties. Oh no. Oh no! No! Why didn't I pull up? No! Eject! Eject! No. Oh no! No, 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 no! The TIE Fighter is the ship on the package, but like other cover protagonists, this one is a little bit weak and thankfully does not overstay its welcome. Okay, the box art ship is actually mostly the TIE Interceptor. It's got a TIE Fighter there, it's got a TIE Bomber there, but you know what, just go with me on this. The TIE Fighter is 6.3 meters long, reaches a maximum of 1,200 kilometers per hour, and is manufactured by Sinar Fleet Systems. Can you tell I've put my new essential guide to vehicles and vessels to work for me? I paid $25 for this book, and I've only just realized I've found a use for it. So we're using it, darn it, even if it's outdated. But seriously, the TIE Fighter is armed with engines and laser cannons. A few fighters might be specifically modified to carry warheads, but typically the idea of a TIE Fighter, in the words of Imperial TIE Fighter Baron Fell, every TIE Fighter you shoot down, a thousand more will take its place. As a TIE Fighter pilot, you are expendable. End of story. It's a wonder you can even rise through the ranks. Next up, we have the TIE Interceptor. TIE Interceptors are 9.6 meters long, travel at the speed of... Okay, the book is now contradicting information from StarWars.Fandom.com, aka Wikipedia. I don't want all the comments on this video to be contradicting me because I'm quoting a book from 2003. So let's all say, haha, and I'll skip the meaningless facts for Star Wars Trivia Night. The TIE Interceptor takes murder to the next level. The idea of TIE Fighters was to make the fastest shooting ship on the market. But the geniuses at Imperial High Command took the basic TIE Fighter and said, Hey, what if instead of two lasers, we gave our pilots four lasers? The more the laserier. I don't remember Kyle Katan saying this, but apparently he said, your generic TIE grunt is just plain suicidal, and the TIE Defender jockey is bloodthirsty. But the TIE Interceptor pilot, he's suicidal and bloodthirsty. When you see a squad of those maniacs flying your way, you better hope your hyperdrive is operational. I strongly disagree with you, Kyle. Speaking within the realm of TIE Fighter the game, it's nice to have more lasers to fire. But if you can't pump the energy from those lasers into your shields, cause, you know, you don't have any, it's just letting you fire a little more rapidly. Otherwise, you're in the same boat as the TIE Fighter with slightly more potential for murder, be it your foes or yourself. 
Next, we have the TIE Bomber. Now we're talking. TIE Bombers are outfitted with an ordnance launcher. Within the realm of these Star Wars flight simulator games, if you can launch a warhead, you can be equipped with a plethora of options from missiles, bombs, and proton torpedoes. With each warhead type, you first need to follow your target with the center of your crosshairs thing at the center of the screen until your targeting computer gets a lock. And unlike Luke Skywalker, don't you dare expect your missile to curve without a lock. If you fire your missile without a full target lock, it'll fly straight or curve slightly towards the target. There are times when your target is so big that you don't need a full lock, but generally speaking, switch to warheads, get a lock, fire your weapon at the right time, and kiss your problems goodbye. In the game, you have access to concussive missiles, which are best suited for enemy fighters rather than capital ships, bases, etc. Proton torpedoes, which aren't nearly as maneuverable as concussive missiles, but pack a stronger punch to compensate. These work best against medium-sized craft or slow, beefy starfighters. Advanced concussion missiles. Basically the improved version of the concussive missile. These are the ones you should be using, especially later in the game, you will never use the older model. You can take down most starship fighters with just one advanced concussion missile, but if in doubt, fire two missiles. These do decent damage to large targets, just not quite as much as a different warhead. But if you're at the end of the mission and have leftovers, let her rip. Advanced Proton Torpedoes, which are simply the upgraded version of the Proton Torpedoes. This time, they're basically effective at destroying anything from platforms to capital ships. Heavy Rockets. If a mission's default loadout has you loaded up with heavy rockets, you know you're going to be taking down something big and something heavy. Heavy rockets are slow but deal huge damage to a target, typically used against stationary objects. But hey, I won't tell if you waste a rocket on a fighter. Space Bombs. You would expect space bombs to be dropped behind your fighter or under it. But nope, it works the same way as the rest of your warheads. You get a lock, you fire it, and it slowly, very slowly, extremely slowly crawls along to wreck someone's day. Space bombs have basically no maneuverability, and the speed is based on how fast you were traveling when you launched them so get to max speed before you drop them. If you want my personal suggestion, fly a ship with a shield, fly closely and aim directly at your target, drop the bombs and scuttle away before the bombs go off. It's actually an effective trick with lots of weapons against larger targets. It's hard to miss if your target fills your viewport. Mag Pulse. Lastly, we have the Mag Pulse. You'll encounter and acquire this technology later in the game but this is a special weapon used to disable craft. You can also stun large capital ship systems for a short time, even before taking down their shields. Okay, to recap, TIE Bomber has two laser cannons, but also launches warheads. Why fly a TIE Fighter when you can fly a bomber and get weapons? Or an interceptor and get two more laser cannons? Because TIE Fighters are cannon fodder, get yourself promoted ASAP! Now we move on to the real fighter ships in the Imperial Navy. The TIE Advanced, originally a promo ship made specifically for our Lord and Savior, Lord Vader. Wait, what? The TIE Advanced is actually the staple ship in the TIE Fighter game, equipped with four laser cannons in total, warhead loadout options, and also set up with a shield generator. If you're flying a TIE Advanced, you know that you're a person of value in the Imperial Navy. I mean, you are flying the ship that met Lord Vader's approval, after all. If that wasn't enough, the TIE Advance can be specially equipped to carry beam technology, of which there are two. The Tractor Beam, which stops all turning in your target's sight, and Jamming, which stops all weapon systems in your target's sight. Some missions require dogfighting, where it's you pitted against those rebel scum pirates, or anyone who has the audacity to challenge the Empire. Other missions require specific instructions, like destroying larger capital ships or capturing a freighter. For special assignments, the Assault Gunboat is called in. The gunboat boasts laser cannons and ion cannons. Ion cannons will not destroy a vessel's hull, 
but disable its system and make it possible to capture. To add to the fun, the assault gunboat carries more missiles than the TIE bomber, and can also fly dogfighting missions to boot. I'm hard pressed to say which I prefer, the TIE advanced or the assault gunboat. Unfortunately, you cannot link your lasers and ion cannons together like you can in X-Wing Alliance, so I think I prefer the TIE advanced for dogfights and the assault gunboat for armament related missions. Arr, murder on the high seas, yar, uh, uh, murder in the darkness of space? It just doesn't flow the same. If the TIE Fighter is your stage 1 Pokemon, and the TIE Interceptor is your stage 2, the TIE Advance is your stage 3, and the TIE Defender is your Gigantamax Pokemon. Equipped with a whopping six lasers, two ion cannons, dual warhead launchers, and beam weapons, you're flying a murder machine. The TIE Defender is the be-all, end-all, best fighter in the game. End of story. Even if Grand Admiral Thrawn thinks the missile boat is better than the TIE Defender, let it be known, Atratsu proclaims the best ship in the game is the TIE Defender. The only problem someone might have with the TIE Defender is experience. There are multiple power systems that need to be juggled, but if you're an avid pilot, you can handle it just fine. Do you like tracking, locking, and firing warheads? Do you like grabbing enemy fighters in a tractor beam and watching them explode from the missiles you fired? Freaking unsupporting sadist? I mean, do I have a ship for you? For the small price of 19 payments of 1999, you too can be the proud owner of this brand spanking new machine meant to counter the superiority of the TIE Defender Project. The missile boat sports four warhead launchers that can be equipped with two different kinds of warheads. And when you're out of warheads, you also have one laser cannon to pew pew defend yourself with. But a full load of advanced concussive missiles means you'll have 80 missiles in total and tractor beams. That's, that's just poor sportsmanship. Come on, take some pride in your work. To add to the complexity, the missile boat is also equipped with a sublight accelerator motor known as a slam. I played through the whole game without using it once, even though a specific mission called for it. The slam is supposed to let you jump closer to a target that is a long way away, but I just dumped all my laser and beam energy into my engines and powered on over the old fashioned way. Once on another mission I accidentally hit the keyboard shortcut to use slams and startled myself. Then promptly the missile boat was no longer used in any future missions. So that's the list of ships and weapons. Naturally, there's always more details if you dig in. For example, I nearly forgot to mention that the TIE Advanced, Gunboat, Defender, and Missile Boat are the only playable ships equipped with hyperdrives. I'm sure some of you viewers would be surprised, and everyone familiar with me wouldn't be surprised, if I told you that we're only just scratching the surface for gameplay in TIE Fighter. We never really touched on the old DOS TIE Fighter game because there were some huge updates graphically speaking, and we went backwards musically speaking. Look, I love DOS chiptune style music. I could go into greater detail about changing your speed to half or quarter to turn faster, commands to give your wingmen, when to dual link your laser cannons, which scenario requires you to fire missiles and finish off your target with laser fire, how to give warhead resupply ships the command to board and refill your ammunition, my personal style for dodging enemy starfighter and capital ship fire, when to fight, when to run, inspecting enemy vessels, each mission has a primary objective, a secondary objective, and others have special objectives, there are multiple difficulties, you can even toggle on cheats, awards, badges, flying certificates, this wicked sweet tattoo I'm tempted to get in real life, you can replay missions in the combat simulator, and I haven't even touched the film room. My latest advice slash trick has been toggling power from my laser cannons into my shields and never trying to recharge my shields manually. I always stabilize my shields energy and toggle extra power from my cannons into my shields. For some bizarre reason, the shield recharge rate is a complete joke. You can raise your lasers, shields, and beam weapons recharge rate with your F8, F9, and F10 keys. 
but for any power that you raise in one area, it decreases the power in your engines. So you will fly at a slower rate if you pump all of your power into auxiliary systems. Again, I strongly encourage checking out the training missions first. There were some mechanics in TIE Fighter that I was unfamiliar with, even with playing X-Wing Alliance in some of the old DOS TIE Fighter game. The training missions will help familiarize you with each ship and its typical missions, and sometimes even special abilities that those ships have. In conclusion, Star Wars TIE Fighter Special Edition is one of those games where you have to learn a lot of things to be able to play it, and play it well. This was back in the day when you really needed to read those game manuals and have a decent joystick to get the most out of your game. TIE Fighter isn't a perfect game, far from it. I ran into glitches all the time. The music on the special edition sometimes stutters and even cut out completely. To get it back, I needed to tinker with the files. My wingmen have no value for their own lives and regularly crash into capital ships, asteroids, and platforms. I've had to destroy my own teammates to keep them from destroying objectives that are supposed to be CAPTURED. The second to last mission was slash is bugged and I needed to clear every enemy ship out of the area and then shoot out the shields on our own friendly asteroid research base while shooting down missiles shot at me for being a traitor. All because the event only triggers when the shields drop on the base. In some ways, I feel like my love for TIE Fighter is undeserved. Let me be the first to say, I'm very much under the influence of nostalgia with this game. It still gets my imagination going that there's potential for discovery. I'm not remotely phased by the graphics, the writing, or anything like that. It's one of the rare few times that I just sit back and say, let's experience my childhood. There's a good chance that many people will feel indifferent or even hate this game. I certainly felt like that on the harder missions, and wondered if I was actually going to even be able to finish the dang old game. And let me underline if you haven't noticed, I played on the easiest difficulty. And this game is still hard to play! Again, there are some mods available, I'll need to check them out someday. And maybe we'll be back here looking at the shiny, upgraded version of TIE Fighter. But, for today, if you can get around the glitches, the buggy AI, the snide Imperial scoldings when you fail, the weird music glitches on the special edition. If you like older games, if you have a decent joystick, if you want to feel like a Star Wars fighter pilot, if you like space flight simulators, if you were into the Star Wars expanded universe, then I can confidently say that you'll get your money's worth from TIE Fighter. By the way, the version that we've covered today is the Steam version, but TIE Fighter is available on several different platforms. Hopefully this video has helped you decide if you want to check it out, or maybe it's just caused you to reminisce over when you used to play this game. Either way, feel free to tell me what you think. Am I blinded by nostalgia? Do you want to see me come back with the revamped modded version? I'd even do it for the DOS version. What obvious detail did I miss in my review? Because I always miss something. Whatever it is, you know where to leave your positive, glowing, encouraging, happy, uplifting, blissful little comments. My name is Atratsu, and I'll see you in the next review. Thank you for watching.